Yeah. And it's really kind of amazing to me, you know, that you can go onto Amazon and go look for a $50 anything almost and be able to spin it around and look at it and get every view of it you can. But a $500,000 house, you get crappy iPhone photos and no real understanding of layout. And I understand all of the reasons that realtors give for not wanting to put too much information up on the web. But from a consumer experience standpoint, I don't get it. As a consumer, I'm really frustrated by that kind of an experience. And that's, I think that's partially why we're seeing some of the potential changes that are occurring in the marketplace with companies who are trying to systematize all of those approaches to things, making certain that the consumer experience that's being delivered is consistent from home to home to home to home. And that's a struggle in traditional real estate. You are listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. Each episode, we bring you the best minds in business and real estate to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching, and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of this week's show. I am super excited to bring you this week's guest, someone I met back during ARIC 2011, who I consider to be a true thought leader in the industry, particularly in all matters digital, and that is sought after speaker and consultant, Jeff Turner. Jeff has been a leader in all things digital in the real estate industry for as long as I can remember, and now he helps tech startups understand and navigate the real estate industry as part of the NAR Incubator Program. He is a much sought after speaker on the cross section of technology trends, human behavior, and of course, artificial intelligence. Some of you might know Jeff from his time at Real Satisfied, IMO Viewer, and DocuSketch, and also for being a friend to many of us Aussies at Inman conferences. In this podcast, you're going to hear Jeff talk about what makes a startup in the industry likely to succeed, where he sees the role of the real estate profession long term, his thoughts on traditional brokerages versus some of the new startup models, and importantly, what are the things real estate agents need to do now to get ready for a world which already includes artificial intelligence. I am sure you guys are going to get a lot out of this episode with Jeff Turner and you'll need to take plenty of notes, particularly when Jeff talks about some of the actionable advice you can take to help future-proof your business. If you want to save time and effort doing that, as usual, we've done the hard work for you. Lots of you are already dialed into Elite Agent Extra, where we aggregate all of the best action tips and tools from all of our podcasts, wrap them up into an easy-to-consume package and deliver them right to your door in the form of a good old fashioned easy to read newsletter so if that sounds like an option you'd like to check out go to eliteagentelevate.com and once you've downloaded this week's show notes hit that big green button to sign up for extra and we'll send you all this month's good stuff in the mail as well as giving you access to all the notes from all of our previous podcast guests that's it from me for now enjoy the show so welcome to the podcast jeff turner nice to be here yeah, it's great to catch up with you again finally because we seem to catch up during these fleeting moments of either you being in Australia or me being in the US. Yeah, and it always seems to be tied to an itinerary that doesn't quite fit either one of our schedules <laughs> perfectly. I know, I know. And I, look, I remember back to Eric 2011, I think it was, when I first met you. I think you, me, and Lara Scott were the only three people on Twitter back then. <laughs> and you gave a great speech on listening skills, which I think, you know, is just so relevant as well again today. Well, so my, you know, my memory of that is not the same as yours. I thought I gave a horrible presentation. And I think it was mainly because it was my first time visiting Australia and I hadn't learned to speak Australian yet. And I hadn't learned to assess Australian humor. So I, standing in front of the audience, I was lost, literally lost. So I'm, I'm glad you remember it better than I do. No, I do remember it well because I thought this guy really knows what he's talking about. And there were a lot of expats, a lot of Americans. Wasn't that the year that 
Rudy Giuliani came out yeah, too. Yeah, I had the misfortune of following Rudy Giuliani, which probably oh. you know didn't help with my nerves at all. I might not be as nervous today as I was then. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we both come a long way, but can you give us a bit of background? So how long have you exactly been in the industry for? My first company was a digital pre-media company, and we had three different division. One division focused on digital printing. One was sort of a true digital design company uh, that got started very, very, very early in the digital design stage, 1985. So I've, I've been at the digital side of things for a long, long time. And the third company was a newspaper digital premedia company. And we focused on automation of newspaper ads, the building of newspaper ads. And after I sold that company in 1999, looking for something to do, I came up with a way to to do virtual tours that hadn't been done before. It's done by everyone now, but at the time we were the first to do it. And so that was in 2001. So I've been playing along the edges of real estate technology now for 18 years, I guess. Yeah. Wow. And so is there something that you find fascinating about real estate technology? Like what is it that you really like about this industry? I think there's a this misconception that real estate is like the most backwards industry on the planet when it comes to technology. And I'm not a hundred percent convinced that that's true. I think it's just a very difficult industry for technology companies to break into because of the, well, in the United States specifically, the independent contractor status of the agent and this sort of maverick feeling that every single agent is their own little business makes it very, very difficult to wrap your hands around the structure of it all. It's becoming less and less of the wild, wild west as data standards improve and as your ability to get to data improves. I think there's a lot of innovation that takes place. And the second side of it that I find really intriguing and probably the most important side of it is that agents are by necessity, some of the best social networkers on the planet. And so the really good realtors, and I end up spending my time around the really, really good realtors, they're just really good humans. That may sound a little bit Pollyannish or unicorns and rainbows, but I don't spend my time personally around non-performing agents, and there are obviously lots of those. And so the best of the best are really, really good at what they do. And they're really good humans. And they almost have to be because of the nature of what you're doing and working with someone as they move into a new home or sell a home. I mean, it's a very personal thing that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it's very similar. I think real estate is so competitive that not only do you have to be a good human, but I think you've also got to be kind of on the cutting edge of everything else that's going on. Well, I think that's it. It's not that the real estate industry is behind in technology. It's just that they're very discerning about things that work and don't work. Of course, there's always a little bit of, you know, shiny object syndrome that takes place and people end up, you know, buying things they don't need at conferences, et cetera. But in general, I think the people who are successful in this industry understand what works, understand what doesn't work. And they're not as susceptible to the hype of a piece of technology when it comes to their business. They're going to run it through its paces and they're going to make intelligent decisions about what they should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. In Australia, particularly, shiny objects come along and there'll be chatter in the Facebook groups and stuff like that, like, oh, another Uber or another this or another that. I thought we were the parochial ones. Well, but, you know, I've said this a number of times and you know, on that trip in 2011, I met David King and Phil Kells, who founded Real Satisfied in Manly Beach, Australia. And I loved their technology. And I loved it for lots of reasons. It was well thought out. It was a really like well executed piece of technology. They were fabulous humans. And I've since come to see other technologies that have started in Australia that have a similar feel. You know, they have really good design thinking. They're not just throwing stuff up against the wall. And I, I think there's something to do with the Australian market and 
you can't just throw something out there and hope that, you know, 1% is going to do it. You don't have a big enough market for that. And so I find that a lot of the technology that's coming out of Australia to be really solid, really, really sound thinking. Now, as I'm working with NAR and Second Century Ventures and some of what they're doing with NAR Reach, some of our most successful companies over the last couple of years have come out of Australia. Yeah, interesting. So I was going to say, you know, you've been involved in a lot of startups and you must see so many interesting products come your way. What are some of the products that you've been involved with that you've been most proud of? Oh, I'm really very proud of what I did at Real Estate Shows, which was the first company that I launched. I sold it a while back, but Real Estate Shows is still going, even though I don't think they've made an update to the technology in years and years and years. I'm very proud of what we did at Real Satisfied. I mean, we really changed the conversation around real estate ratings and testimonials and feedback. And I think we created an environment for companies like Rate My Agent, another Australian company, to really come and make their way into the United States market. I'm very very proud of what we accomplished at Real Satisfied. Yeah, I love those guys too and I love the product and actually I really love the fact that you could own your own reviews as an agent. Like I still don't think that there is any other product out there that does that where you can actually have control over your own feedback. Yeah, and I think they went deeper too. You know, this whole notion of taking the opportunity to really understand whether or not you delivered rather than just seeking a testimonial. You know, it's easy just to seek a testimonial. Give me your testimonial, trash the stuff that doesn't work. The nice thing about the way the surveys were organized is that it really did encourage a great deal of feedback that, you know, maybe it's not easy to listen to, but necessary. And often that detail was kept private to the agent so the broker could improve without necessarily impacting their ability to go to market with a really good testimonial. It's possible that somebody can think very, very highly of you and wish that you had done something better in one aspect or another of that transaction. And I think that's the portion of the ratings game that gets lost. You know, a good business is going to try and understand exactly what they did and did not do as they perform their service. They're not just going to go out seeking marketing sound bites. Yeah, absolutely. And people are funny too. Like if you're brilliant, they'll leave you like a five-star review and a glowing reference. If you're terrible, they'll leave you a one-star review and a glowing reference. But like you say, they won't actually give you some feedback on how you can improve moving forward. Yeah, it's it's sort of an all or nothing kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, actually, if you were mediocre, they just don't fill out anything. Yeah, you'll just, never hear from them you know, again. Leave you alone yeah. and sort of go on. Absolutely. So tell me what have you been focusing on recently in Second Century Ventures? It's interesting how this all came about because I've been a mentor for the NAR Reach program, which is their event-based accelerator since its conception in 2013. And I've really enjoyed it. I enjoy the giving back. You know, it is all of the mentors who come and give their time to reach do so as volunteers. I was that way. Everyone is still that way. It's really a how do you give back to this real estate community? How do you help these real estate startups understand what it's going to take to succeed in the North American real estate market? And so I really enjoyed that process. I've always enjoyed that process. And while I was still with Real Satisfied after the purchase of Real Satisfied from Playster, I was in a mentoring session with a company called Immoviewer, which was the first foreign company to be accepted into the Reach Accelerator based out of Potsdam, Germany. And I met Ralph von Grafenstein and Steve Bintz, who at the time were running North America and just had one of those moments like I had with David King and Phil Kells, where we really hit it off. I had a pretty clear understanding of what they were trying to accomplish. I had some pretty harsh words to say about what they were facing Mm -hmm. with the technology they were bringing over. But I accepted the role of running their North American technology not long after those mentor meetings. And that actually got me on the other side of the equation with NAR Reach in seeing how they work with the companies. And that's what led me to, after this past year's NAR, go to NAR Reach and say, I'm interested in doing something bigger. And so I split my time now between some consulting relationships, a consulting relationship now with ImmoViewer, with NAR Reach. And I'm happy to say that Phil and David and I are going to get the band back together and we're starting another real estate startup together as well. Oh, super. Watch this space. (laughs) (laughs) Is 
some of your is that available here in Australia or is that just it is. We don't really have a large Australian presence, but it is available in Australia. We've developed a new product that is an offshoot of Immobiliar that we call DocuSketch that's focused on home inspection and restoration. It's designed specifically to capture 360 images inside of a home. We have some really amazing algorithms that allow us to build floor plans and three-dimensional models off of standard 360 photos. So just your run-of-the-mill $250 360 camera. And I think the home inspection and restoration industries are more ready for that technology. As much as the consumer is clamoring for true virtual tours of homes, the, the truth of the matter is that even today, even after Matterport has spent millions and millions of dollars, less than 3% of homes actually have a true virtual tour. Steve Bintz, uh, who has kept his real estate license active, and he's a realtor in Rochester, he looked at homes in Rochester, New York. And we just took that one area just to see what it was. More homes sold with no photos, no photos, than homes that had virtual tours. So I think there's a great deal of complacency around it. You know, it's, it's a nice to have. It's not a need to have kind of a thing. Homes sell if they're priced right, regardless of the kinds of marketing you do. And so the real estate agents who are doing really, really great marketing are doing it for reasons other than this is to sell the home. And I think they understand that. Yeah, I think it's funny, you know, like I've sort of been looking at a few properties lately as well. And I tend to look at the fact, like, you know, given the photos have to be good. But if it's got a floor plan, I usually don't even go to the video. It's sort of like click, 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 yes, yes, yes. There's the floor plan. Okay, I can see how that looks. Yeah, and it's really kind of amazing to me, you know, that you can go onto Amazon and go look for a $50 anything almost and be able to spin it around and look at it and get every view of it you can. But a $500,000 house, you get crappy iPhone photos and no real understanding of layout. And I understand all of the reasons that realtors give for not wanting to put too much information up on the web. But from a consumer experience standpoint, I don't get it. As a consumer, I'm really frustrated by that kind of an experience. And that's, I think that's partially why we're seeing some of the potential changes that are occurring in the marketplace with companies who are trying to systematize all of those approaches to things, making certain that the consumer experience that's being delivered is consistent from home to home to home to home. And that's a struggle in traditional real estate. Yeah, absolutely. So you see a lot of startups and everyone, well, actually, I've stopped hearing the Uber of real estate lately. I think they got the message that we're a bit sick of that phrase. The whole North American market right now is fixated on the iBuyer. Yeah, I saw that coming out of Inman, actually. I wasn't at this Inman, but it was all about the iBuyer, wasn't it? You see a lot of the startups. What do you look for in the next big thing? I'm actually looking for the same kinds of things that people are looking to the iBuyer for. You know, who's really paying attention to the consumer pain and who's trying to solve for it? I just look at it differently, you know, and actually it's a good way to sort of segue into it iBuyers started out with this feeling that they were going to disintermediate in some way an agent from that transaction. And what you're seeing now is that they're all sort of coming around to this idea or this notion that they have to keep the agent inside of the transaction. There are certain things that I think brokers and agents can learn from all of these different i buyer models, whether it's Divi or Open Door or Zillow Offers or whoever it is. And the question that they need to be asking themselves is, what problem do they think they're solving? Whether they're really solving it or not, what problem do they think they're solving for the consumer? Is that a real problem? If you're a broker and agent, I think you should be looking at these companies as a testing ground for ideas. If they prove to be real, then the next question you should be asking yourself is, what can I do to solve for that same consumer pain? Focus on what pain is being 
alleviated on the consumer side, whatever that is, whatever they've identified. And sometimes it's a repackaging of an old idea that just is sort of brought into the future knock or open door. Is it really any different than we buy ugly houses.com or I'll buy your house if it doesn't sell in three? It's really not. It's been around for years and years and years and years and years. It's just being packaged differently. It's like I often say to people, there's no news. It's the same things happening to new people. It's, you know, that's funny. That's actually a good way to state it. You know, knock, which is another one of these eye buyers out here is really just a form of a bridge loan. You know, yeah. so how are you going to look at it? How is it being repackaged? And again, the basic question is, what problem are they solving? So to me, the problem that an eye buyer is solving is, number one, I don't want to have to deal with someone who is painful. And number two is I want a quick sale. And I'm probably prepared to sacrifice a bit of margin for that. So if you solve for those pains, then I need a real estate agent that's going to be there when I want them there, but not try and annoy me all the time, for lack of a better phrase. I want someone that's going to sell my house quickly. And I don't necessarily want top dollar, but I'm prepared to go down that path to get those other things that I happen to be valuing at that moment in time. Yeah. And I think the deciding factor is what's a bit. When you say I'm willing to give up a bit. A bit. Yeah. What is a bit? The numbers I'm hearing are not particularly good. Yeah. So am I really willing to give up an extra 5% for that convenience? Uh, maybe some people are, but I don't think most people are. And I don't think we're ever going to see, you know, there's some people who are predicting that the iBar will dominate 50% of the market. I don't believe that for one second. I think it's probably going to hover between 5 and 10%, but it ends up being, on the other side of the equation, a really good lead capture system. Not like we need another lead capture system, but it is a really good lead capture system because I'm now seriously saying I'm willing to sell my home if you're willing to solve for all of these other problems that I'm trying to get solved. And I think it does open up other opportunities too. One of the companies that I love in, in this year's uh, reach class is a company called Curbio. And what Curbio basically does is try to get you more of the equity that's trapped inside your home. If you've been in a home for the last 20 years and you haven't updated in 20 years, everyone knows that if you do a bit of renovation before you sell that house, you will get a higher price and you will have a faster sale. And so they come in and say, yeah, nobody really wants to do that. We'll do it for you. We'll take care of all of it. We'll manage it all. We'll get you more money. You won't pay us anything until the house closes. And so the other side of that coin is some people are willing to say, you know what? I'll delay for a little bit if somebody's going to manage that painful process of renovating my home so that I can get more equity out of my house. And so I think there's a spectrum of people. And I think convenience as a currency is a trend that's here to say. The question is, where is the convenience going to be placed? At what point in the transaction for me is that convenience going to have the greatest value? And that'll be my currency. On my side of the equation, personally, it depends on whether my kids are in school or not in school. It's going to depend on how much pain I want to go through post-close. Most of the pain that I've experienced as a consumer has come after I've signed a contract. It has almost nothing to do with the agent. It has to do with everyone else. So I think there's plenty of room for improvement in all of the, the different processes that come once a consumer signs a contract that have nothing to do with the basic processes of getting a home from I've listed it to I've found a buyer. Most of the pain comes once you've found a buyer and you start to go to contract. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's pure gold, what you just said then in the currency being convenience, because obviously everyone also has a different level of convenience in their minds. And as an agent, you've got to find that out. I think so. And I think that's one of the intriguing things about this. I think agents are uniquely, the caveat is a good agent is uniquely trained to understand what's the right thing for this consumer. Do they need a faster sale with whatever, fill in the blank, or are they really just looking to get as much value out of their home as possible, but they don't want all of the hassle that comes as a result of that. Somehow 
the industry has to have sort of customizable strategies that are based upon each consumer's level of pain and what they're willing to put up with and to make the models shift and move and focus on those things that are most important to the individual. Let's talk about automation. Okay. (laughs) Because there's lots of people talking about automation and we're going to talk about AI shortly as well because it wouldn't be a podcast on real estate without talking about AI. Yeah. So, There is a big push towards automation, like people in Australia, and I'm sure people in the US are talking about automating processes to the nth degree to become more efficient, to make sure that the admin is taken care of so that they can spend more time with consumers talking about convenience and what they value and all that sort of stuff. How automated do you think real estate is going to get? I think different parts of the processes are going to be very automated. Let's look at appraisals uh, as an example. You know, there are already measures being pushed through various legislative bodies that are going to do away with the physical presence of an appraiser at the home up to a certain price here in the United States. And so some of that has to do with much better ways of analyzing data to come up with, you know, as much as agents don't believe that these automated valuation models are necessarily accurate, they get pretty close in a lot of cases to getting you there. And so you're going to see streamlined automated process on the appraisal side of the equation. I think the same thing is going to happen in mortgage origination and under you know, those processes are going to become more and more automated. And we're also seeing there's a company in Brisbane, Get Air, that is automating certain conversations and certain aspects of the real estate transaction. Uh, Emory.ca, there's a company called Conversica that is, you know, really using natural language processing to handle emails back and forth between consumers to do very specific functions. And there's a quote, I believe his name is Izzy Smart. He was Four Seasons founder said, systematize the predictable, humanize the exceptional. And I think for real estate, that's the way brokers and agents and leaders need to be thinking. What things are predictable? What things are knowable? What things are repetitive? What things are mundane? What things are purely informational? Systematize those things. And then humanize the exceptional aspects of the transaction that need to be humanized, that need a human touch. That's where we're going to see the biggest shifts and changes is when people begin to truly understand what things require a human being to be involved and what things really don't require a human being to be involved at all. And a lot of those lead up questions that come when somebody's standing in front of a house and they just want pieces of information to determine whether or not they want to go further don't really require the human to be on the phone. They require immediate responses. And I think we're going to see more and more of those kinds of things. And I think we should. There's been a few theories floated in Australia. We've called it attraction agent, you know, like people being attracted to agents. But really, choosing an agent is going to be one of the final things in the process as technology gets better because consumers are going to have that information even more than they do now at their fingertips before an agent gets called in. And that's part of what we're already seeing. So those kinds of things are informational, right? And I think where agents and brokers need to be focusing is on judgment work. What things require human judgment? How can I bring my expertise to bear on this transaction in a way that improves upon the information gathering or the information presentation? So it's one thing to be able to to get to all those pieces of information, but most decisions require insight that are beyond what artificial intelligence can squeeze from data alone. And I think that's where the human comes into play. Yeah. I still love a quote that goes something like wisdom equals knowledge applied. I think it goes that way. Yeah. And I think if you, if you understand that, then you can also then stop fearing AI as this thing that is necessarily going to come and take away your job as much as it is truly an assistant, a colleague who's going to come in and help you do your job better, help make your job easier, do the parts of the job that, you know, quite frankly, none of us really want to do. 
that's really the key. You know, how do you work like a designer in a way where you're piecing together the best bits and pieces and making this look like something completely different than it looked like before and yet still values the things that you do very, very well in a way that highlights it and then gets all of the other stuff out of the way. What do you think is the future of some of the, you know, in Australia we have franchises and there are big groups in America and what we're seeing at the moment is some groups that are more nimble. So in the US you've got EXP Realty and their virtual world (laughs) and they're kind of giving power to the agent Brands like At Realty and EView in Australia are doing similar things, although they don't have the virtual world, but they have structures around them. Are the days of the big traditional brokerage numbered? I don't know. I would hate to bet against some of these big traditional brokerages and their ability to adapt. Yeah. I think there's a lot of advantage to the human contact that comes from an office. You know, I've worked remotely with companies around the world for the last few years, and I can tell you right now that it's not all grass is greener on the other side in the virtual world. And I have my real estate license. I am actually a realtor now. I did it so that I could understand the process. I hang my license at EXP. Uh, this is the first time I'm actually saying that publicly, by the way. Okay. I'm not out trying to recruit people to join EXP or do any of that kind of stuff. But that's where I hang my license because it's easy. And so I think there is a certain benefit to reducing the costs associated with the brick and mortar on real estate. I think more and more that's not nearly as necessary as it has been in the past. And at the same time, it's still true that if you've got a sign on the street, you get attention. And if you've got signs in yards, you get attention. All of the surveys we did at Real Satisfied indicated that signage was actually a bigger determining factor in what agent I called than anything I saw online. So the world still operates in very predictable ways. And it's very difficult to change people's mindsets and attitudes around those things. Um, so I wouldn't discount the ability for some of these a more traditional real estate brokerages to adapt their systems and their workings to whatever works. Purple Bricks recently made a hasty exit from both Australia and the USA, and I've got my own theory on that. But what are your thoughts on the low cost or fixed fee? Will it work outside of the iBuyer kind of model? I just don't believe commissions are the pain point. People have been dealing with low cost discount models for years and years and years and years. The pain isn't really the commission. And so when you come in and you make that your dominating message and your dominating factor, then you're missing what the real pain is. You're missing what the consumer is really looking for. So I don't, until someone is able to do a combination of messaging that says, I'm going to give you everything you're looking for, and it's still going to cost you less money as a secondary thing. I mean, think about it in the United States. I don't feel any of that pain. It's all borne by the sale. And so I don't buy that commissions are the pain point. People keep trying to make commissions the pain point. I just don't buy it. As a consumer, I'm willing to pay for someone to do a really good job for me especially on something like the sale of a home. So I think it's the wrong message. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, let's go back to what you were just saying a little bit earlier about the currency of convenience. I suppose if we put it back into that context, then commissions are definitely not the pain point. I think the numbers, and I'm not even going to quote them because I'm going to get them wrong, but it's not a little bit that people are giving up in some of these iBuyer equations. It's quite a bit. Yeah. And if that's true, then commissions can't be the thing. Yeah. So it's something else. It's something else. Yeah. Okay, let's get tactical now. Okay. So what three things do you think agents should be doing right now to get prepared to be successful in the future? One of the things they need to do is test things early. 
They can't be afraid of new technology. They just can't. Put yourself in a position where you become a guinea pig to a certain extent. Figure out what's real yourself. This is probably more true for brokers and how they introduce technology and solutions in, but test this stuff early. Get ahead of the curve on it and don't allow someone else to dominate the conversation around it or to make you you feel like you're missing out on something. Most of these things don't require a tremendous amount of time or investment to learn how to do them. Do it yourself. Figure it out. Test it out. See if it works for you. Don't be afraid of it. Stop fearing it. The second thing that I would say is work on your soft skills even more than you do today. I think in a world dominated by artificial intelligence, people who can truly genuinely connect with other humans are going to be more valuable than less valuable. We're going to see more and more automation come into play. And if you can, you know, let's come back to the 2011 conversation. One of the greatest gifts that you can give someone is to actually listen to them. Mm. You know, take your phone, sit it down on the table have a conversation where you're making real eye contact and, you know, give them that gift. Those kinds of skills make you invaluable. And then the third thing I would say is invest, invest in the technologies that work. So try them all and then truly make the commitment to invest in the technologies that work, but not forgetting the soft skills that truly differentiate you from every other human being. How are you going to distinguish yourself from an AI chatbot? That's the question I'd be asking myself. How are you going to distinguish yourself from a chatbot? Speaking of AI then, it does move very fast. So what would be your recommendation for agents to stay on top of that sort of stuff so that, I mean, I know things come flying past my desk at a million miles an hour, but for an agent, you know, it's harder to stay on top of things. How do you make sure that what's new keeps coming in your door, basically? I don't know that I have an answer to that question other than continue reading, continue going to conferences, continue listening to your podcast, all of the things that somebody should be doing to make certain that they at least have an understanding of, of what's possible and go outside the real estate industry. Mm. Get yourself attached to some technology journals that are going to open your eyes to things that might truly blow your mind. There's so many things happening outside of the real estate industry that, quite frankly, are never going to have an impact on the real estate industry. But understanding that they exist makes you stop and go, you know what? There's all sorts of things possible that I never dreamed were possible before. What are three tools we should check out right now? I'm using one right now. We talked about it before this started. It's my favorite piece of artificial intelligence. It's called crisp.ai. It's only available for the Mac. If you're like me and you wind up having to run into a coffee shop to do a conference call or something else, crisp.ai will change your life. It literally removes all of the background noise using artificial intelligence and allows you to sit in a noisy cafe and have a conference call for a busy on the road real estate agent. I think that would be an indispensable tool. Again, you need a Mac for it, but it works beautifully. The second thing that I'd be doing is taking a look at tools that make it easier for me to have a high touch feel without my having to actually do the work. So I don't know whether this is available in Australia, so I apologize if it's not, but there's an app that I use called Punk Post that is brilliant. It actually has humans who write notes, not a machine that's writing the note. When I need to send a thank you card and I need it to be absolutely brilliantly done, I type it on my phone, I hit send, and then this human does this wonderfully beautiful handwritten note that gets shipped off to the person and I move on with my life. Wow. And then I would be experimenting right now with some of these AI chatbots to reduce the friction and the amount of time that I was having to spend answering the mundane questions every single day. There's a bunch of them out there. I mentioned Get Air which is an Australian company that I think is doing some good work. Imri.ca, which is based if you're in North America and you're listening to this podcast, that's a good one. There's lots of different chatbots that are going to become available very, very soon. 
Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. I mean, you know, there's so much going on. I think we could probably chat for hours. <laughs> but if there was one piece of actionable advice that you could leave everyone with, what would it be? Don't be afraid. I mean, this is going to sound really like simple advice, but there's a lot of fear mongering that's taking place about, you know, what's going to happen with artificial intelligence and where it's headed. I think as a species, we've done a pretty good job of adapting to the technology changes that have come our way. And we'll figure this one out too. And I actually think real estate of all the professions is probably poised to withstand most of the artificial intelligence activities that come along just simply because of the nature of the transaction and how human it actually is. So just stop being afraid. Uh, stop viewing it as some killer thing that you need to be worried about and just adapt. Yeah, and be a good human. Be a good human. Jeff Turner, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. To connect with all things Elite Agent, including the latest news, coaching, and features, subscribe at our website, EliteAgent.com.